Today's presentation is entitled Calling Dr. Google. Our speaker is Dr. Santiago Hernandez, MD, who will tell us when and how to use the internet as a tool when it comes to our health. Dr. Hernandez grew up in Chicago since the age of two after his family immigrated from Michoacan. He received his BA in Spanish and Biology from Indiana University and his medical training at the Universidad Autónoma de Guadalajara as medical doctor and surgeon. He did postgraduate studies in family medicine in the U.S. and has been a member of the American Academy of Family Physicians since 2012. He currently practices in Chapala. Let's welcome Dr. Santiago. Well, good morning. It's very nice to see a few uh, friendly and familiar faces. Thank you uh, for the folks who have um, took my invitation to attend. And uh, Dr. Banks, thank you for inviting me to speak. Okay. Well, first and foremost, they, they went, uh, thank you for the lovely presentation. Okay. Um, taking a note, from uh, David Dennis's med meditation, I think that's a very good place to start. When you look in the mirror and your body is not working as it should be, what do you do? Okay? Um, I think that one of the most um, disarming moments that we could ever experience as human beings is when you go to another human being and tell them, Something's not right with my body. Help me fix it. As a physician, that's a type of um, responsibility we've been trained to help, to manage, to help others. I think the great majority of us who get into medicine or any sort of being a healthcare provider, we do this uh, with this in mind. Help another try to fix something that's wrong with their body or trying to prevent something from going wrong, okay? Unfortunately, as I see here in my type of practice, the ravages of aging are something that we simply cannot prevent from happening. We can try to do it, but, you know, we haven't gotten to that magic pill or that fountain of youth thus far, okay? And um, from that, before we even get to our, uh, get to see our doctor, many times um, we learn this before we move here into the States or because uh, we have moved here from the U.S., Canada, etc., other countries, oftentimes there are a, there, there's a language and a cultural barrier when you see physicians here or other healthcare providers. So what do you do? Well, there's been a great, great tool that's called the Internet. Okay, Dr. Google. Okay, now the Internet came about, you know, it's uh, from the U.S. government. Uh, they implemented it way back when. And I remember when I was in college at Indiana University. Our, uh, that, I, it was a really cool thing when I got my first email account to the university. What do you use an email for? What do you use the Internet I, for communication? It was mainly, I, I worked in a a molecular biology lab, and that's what we've used to communicate with scientists halfway across the world working on very similar projects. Okay? Um, then there were IRC chat rooms, for whatever, for card collecting, stamp collecting, you name it. Now, it's grown, it's evolved, the internet has evolved, and we use it for communication with our families, friends, not only colleagues. We also use it when we are seeking information. You can find anything on there from finding a good hotel in Nice, uh, halfway around the world, to finding a uh, gluten-free type of recipe that, for pizza. Okay? 
Most importantly now, what? One in 20 Google searches is now for healthcare-related information. One in 20. Okay? So the vast of what do the vast, that's what the vast majority of us do now. We go online, before we even go to our doctor, or nurse, or call our friends, etc. I've got something going on. My stomach doesn't feel right. Okay? So we go on the internet. Okay, now, what are the pros? There are actually quite a few pros to doing that. It's very easy to use. You need internet connection, you need electricity, computer, etc. There are thousands upon thousands of pages of information in your own language, not to name the others, French, Polish, Spanish, etc. Okay? It also helps inform the general public or the person who's speaking or who's seeking the information about the, uh, with general information about a particular topic. It's great. You know, back in the day, we'd have to make the trip to the library. I remember when I was in junior high, high school. Yes, you know, my parents still invested in buying uh, an encyclopedia. Okay? We have these big encyclopedias still in storage in my head. Or, you know, we saved up for one. <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, my dad being a steel worker, it wasn't until I almost graduated from high school that we got our encyclopedia. So I had to make many trips to the public library. Okay? And we'd have to help, we'd ask the help of the librarian, you know, to get us to the information. This is a lot more tedious. Okay? But we could get a lot of information. Okay? And another pro now is it really helps bridge a large gap of knowledge that was almost exclusively of a doctor. And a patient versus the patient. Okay, remember the days of uh, I don't know how many of you grew up in small towns. Well, the, the the city of Chicago where I grew up wasn't all that large. It was uh, northwest of yes, steel town, and we had our own Spanish-speaking doctors there that helped our community, and we used to go to them and my family. And you know, the doctors were these gods of knowledge. Okay, very few times would you think of even questioning their knowledge. Okay? Very few times. You know, you look at shows like Beave It, Leave It to Beaver and all of that. And, you know, these, these doctors still had a very prominent place in their communities. Okay? Not so much anymore, unfortunately. <laughs> Not so much. The way medicine has been uh, evolving has made us, uh, I hate to say, oftentimes a little bit more than waiters. Okay? You had option A, B, or C, and pick and choose. But how do you know which best, which option is best for you? Well, let's turn to the internet. Okay. Now, what are the pitfalls from this rapidly evolving tool? Now, we know many tools they come with instructions. Do they not? You, you, you buy a wood press, you, you buy a jack, you know, that can change your tires. They come with instructions. Okay. The internet is a wonderful tool, and unfortunately it does not have any instructions. It's a wonderful tool, but it's also a very dangerous tool. Okay? So, how do we know what to use? Because instructions don't come included. Okay? Many times, you know, because of uh, freedom of speech, etc., really, as most of you know and do, you post information to the internet. Nobody vets it. We're not living in North Korea. We're not living in China, where it has to go through government filters, etc. Okay, and much of the information there is unvetted. It may be erroneous. It's very subjective, uh, at least. Okay, often the information that we find is confusing or very contradictory. Okay, when we get specifically on Google, which is I think the most commonly used search engine. We often forget that the top searches that appear on those web pages are often paid for, or they're a product of very strategic SEO, um, SEO placement, strategic uh, search engine optimization. And I, for one, I use it. Okay, I, I use that as a tool. Well, if you're looking for a doctor to follow up, yeah, I want to be one of those top results. Well, I've got to pay the man. I've got to pay Google. Okay. And many times we don't remember that 
companies, governments, institutions pay to appear on the, uh, those, uh, those, uh, the top of the page or on the sidebar. Okay? Uh, another thing that is a pitfall is that uh, these you know, these search engines use your own past search history to guide you, okay, for you, the results that pop up on, uh, you know, you search headaches, chest pain, you know, uh, maybe if you've searched, uh, I, I don't know, the bad, where to buy the best glasses, or you're searching for medication for reflux, etc., those uh, search engine results will very much reflect your past search engine history, okay? One pitfall I see that, uh, although it's a great tool, it has helped foster and undermine trust between a healthcare provider, a doctor, and the patient. It's created a culture sometimes of distrust with institutions, persons, involved in healthcare, okay? I think uh, there, there are many people I, I hear many times when I prescribe such and such medication, they come back, oh, this is by such big pharmaceutical company, et cetera, they think that I'm in the pocket. Honestly, uh, Pfizer, whatever, does not visit me. Okay, they do not visit my little clinic in uh, Lake Chapala, okay? They have bigger fish to uh, fry, et cetera, okay? But more importantly, I think it has created a culture of what we, there's a new term called cyberchondria. <laughs> Have any of you heard that term before? Cyberchondria. Yeah. You know, when we were in, when I was in first year, second year of medical school, we're bombarded with all of these new um, diseases, with all of these things that put you at risk, family history, this, that, the other. And you're sitting there in, in the room, the classroom, and think, holy smoke, I got a headache and I got a diarrhea and I just went to the beach, you know, and or I had a trip to Mexico, oh man, I really could have salmonella. It's probably not salmonella, I have this, that, the other. You know, afterwards, you know, we kind of develop a, a thick skin to that stuff, okay? But it, it, it's just a reflection that we're not immune from those, uh, from those thoughts, okay? So, without any instructions. How do we use this wonderful tool known as the internet when it comes to our own health? Okay, when we can't get in to see the doctor right away. Okay, as soon as we need to be. When um, our doctor or healthcare providers or our very well-intentioned friends give us information that we don't know, frankly, we can trust. Okay, we turn, well, here's the internet. Within Less than 30 seconds, you'll have many, many choices of information of which to click on and guide you, okay? First and foremost, he is a physician. Uh, I think my generation of doctors has been trained, albeit we, we, we still be trained to deal with this, okay? Now, as opposed to 20 years ago, medical schools, we now have cultural sensitivity training how to t uh, uh, talk to patients from different, um, from different cultures, backgrounds, etc. I remember I was helping teach while I was doing my board exams in, in the U.S. at the University of Chicago. Um, they had cultural sensitivity. It, you know, and I, it was dumb on because even when I went through med school just a few years earlier, we had none of it. Okay, yeah, what, what do you do if somebody from Ecuador comes in and they put these little collars on the children, this, that, the other, and then and again, it's, it, it, it's really, they foster the, the teaching of the art of medicine to teachers. They don't, you can't find that on the internet, so, and also, one of the, one of the things that we had to deal with with cultural and societal training is, what do you do when somebody comes in and says, I've got this, I'm here for a second opinion. Okay? They self-diagnose. Okay? You've got this. Well, doc, you know, Google says, I've got this. i got A, B, and C. Is this true? I need this medication. Okay? All right. Well, first and foremost, when you, are be, when you are sitting down, when you're sitting down and are about to begin your search, 
first and foremost, what is your goal? Okay? That's what I like to try to, you know, uh, ask my patients. Now, what's your goal when you come to see me as a doctor? What do you expect to get out of this office visit? The same thing. You say, what do you get to, what do you expect to get out of that search? Okay? Well, what are you searching for? Are you searching to vet persons, institutions, medications? Are you searching to quiz your doctor? Maybe to challenge your diagnosis. Is her diagnosis? Or what I really advise is: Are you searching for information to help teach or inform your doctor? Okay, you know it's there. There, there are new medications coming about every day. There are many ways to heal our bodies. Okay, alternative medicine. Okay, that really complements a lot of what we do. But there's only I only have so many times. So many hours a day to study, and so many years of my life to uh, be dedicated to being behind, uh, keeping my nose in books. So I often do count on patients to inform me. Look, doctor, I've been taking this such and such uh, tea, and here are the health benefits. Of course, you know they have their own sources, and I think that's wonderful. Okay, but you also have to ask yourself if the the, the, the links that you're getting, the web pages, they provide subjective or objective information. Okay? There are many, many websites such as Yelp, etc., uh, and the, the famous Chapala.com web boards that provide <laughs> much subjective information. Okay? But uh, for many patients, but when most of the public, there's pretty very little health information to go on. You have to kind of sometimes put yourself in the shoes or in the place, which is very difficult to do, of the people who are writing such reviews. Okay? Many times people just have gotten bad news. And they may be going through one of the phases of uh, acceptance, etc. It's a very emotional when a time when somebody gets bad news. They don't know who to lash out at. Okay? And even my doctor doesn't know what he's talking about. I can't have this. I've been healthy as a horse 80 years of my life. What does it mean that I have breast, um, well, I have breast cancer or lung cancer? Now? I mean, I just recently experienced it with my own mother about a little more than a year ago. Diagnosed with breast cancer. Oh, she went through all the states. What do you mean I got breast cancer? I eat right, I, you know, drink Google web every day, I exercise at the gym four times a week, this, that, the other. Really, she had that cardiovascular health of a four-year-old. I can't say, but she got cancer. So who did she turn? And I sat her down and said, Mom, people are going to come at you from left and right, from in front from behind with information. It's very well-intentioned. Okay, but keep this in mind. It's subjective, etc. Okay, stick with what we know if you want to choose that route. Okay, so you have to ask yourself, what are your goals? What, what, what information are you seeking? What's the goal? What are you going to do with that information? Number two, how trustworthy is this information that's subjective or objective? Okay, I like to use the term evidence-based medicine. That's the type of medicine I practice. I practice allopathic medicine, which is medicine based on years and years of research of going through the scientific methods. Okay? I think most of you are familiar with what the scientific method is, right? It's not perfect. It's not perfect, but it's, you know, it, it, that's the best thing we've got going now. You know, every so often we hear in the news that there are articles in very, very prominent medical and science journals that publish erroneous information. Well, what are you going to do? I, I don't know. That's, I've had little else to go on. But I ask yourself, also take those other those, those other good websites, which I will later dive into, with a grain of salt. Now, so how much do you trust Dr. Google? Okay, let's get behind the computer screen, and I'll put in a simple, which I do not recommend. I do not recommend that you use a search with a simple headache. Okay, headache. I'm going to go through each of these, and then I'm going to ask you, 
what word or phrase that you're going to hear consistently. I Google headache. What comes up? Brain tumor, meningitis, brain bleed. I Google sore throat, throat cancer, throat infection, acid reflux, back pain, slip dash herniated disc, bone cancer, spine tumor, sciatica, prostate cancer. I Google cough, lung cancer, asthma, cold, flu, rash. Measles, skin allergy, melanoma. I Google diarrhea, bowel cancer, <laughs> IBS, food poisoning. I Google chest pain, heart attack, lung cancer, acid reflux. Now, what word resonated the most? Exactly. Exactly, exactly. Now, here's the thing that the trouble is that. It's human nature to seek out the most exciting story so that we're attracted to rare and worst case scenarios. When we go through our medical school training, we're drilled on all our board exams. What are the most common causes? What's the most common cause? What's the most common cause? This, that, the other. We're trained, you know, they say, if you hear hooves outside of the door, it's most likely a horse. It's not a zebra. Rare means rare. Okay? Rare means rare. Okay? There are those instances, though, when, you know, I, I will say that patients do come to me and, you know, they, they, they say, look, doctor, I've been looking this, and just things aren't right. You know, I get to see your body in my office 15, 20 minutes. That's just a very small snapshot compared to what you walk around in. People know their bodies better. I had somebody when I first got to town, came in with, in with me for a year and a half. Just with the knee and knee that she runs, she would be running at least five miles every morning. Then uh, after her run, she goes to be healthy, etc. She, she has some of the best arms I've ever seen on a person. Physically fit, like you wouldn't believe at the age of 65, 60, 65. And she told me, look, there's something not right. Well, we did everything that was in my scope. It's a Tennessee hematologist, because she had a knee. Okay. Good for her, and the hematologist saw something else that uh, 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 they had They guaranteed they we diagnosed her with a uh, uh, rare multiple myeloma. Okay, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, she is a fatigue, most common cause, et cetera. That, that, that was something that, well, that was really ingrained into me. What are the most common causes? Now, this is one of the rare causes. When people are fatigued, etc. Really, it's a lot, most of the time here in, in Japan, I mean, it's like a sleep. It's those mid-afternoon cocktail parties. It's the great diet that we have here, etc. Okay? You know, people like to actually conduce it. I get it, okay? But those are the most common causes. Not that you have some really rare blood type of cancer, leukemia. Now, contrary to popular opinion these days, Doctors, we, we do like our patients to be informed. We like them to use the internet. It's made our lives, uh, our work, a, a lot easier. The number one cause for malpractice lawsuits in the U.S. is due to lack of information, lack of communication between doctors. Most of the time, doctors say, you know, and I just saw this with my best friend who has a family practice clinic in Aurora. He sees 40 patients in an eight-hour day, 40 patients. That's just to keep afloat. On a good day, you see 60. Okay? Now, do we have the time to sit there at, in the U.S. and Canada to educate our patients as we should be? You know, when we graduate med school, gosh, we're so done with we're going to save the world. Unfortunately, insurance, paperwork, this, that, the other, really takes the wind out of our sails. And we, you know, my friend, five years ago, he was almost bankrupt because he saw four patients a day, so he was spending time. But now, he had to turn this thing into the machine. So, there's no time. We do like this information. But how do we use this information? Okay? Well, I would stress again, do not randomly Google your symptoms. I stress one more time. Rare conditions are still rare. If you Google 
if, if something is bothering you enough to sit behind a computer and Google. You know, I've had a headache for the past three, four nights. I haven't had a headache this strong in my life. You know what? You need to get in touch with your doctor. If it's bothering you that much, okay? If you do go, you know, and if you shrug it up, okay, you know, I saw Dr. I, this is Dr. Hernandez's lecture. He says, rare is rare. I don't have a brain bleed, et cetera. But it's, you know what? If it's bothering you enough, then go see your doctor, okay? That's one of the pitfalls that you are on, you may underdiagnose. Some people are the cyberchondriacs, where other people are like, well, you know what? Um, I've got this cough. Maybe it's because I used to smoke. I've had a cough for three months. Well, and you should have seen your doctor. Okay? So that's one thing. If you've bothered, if you've taken the time to Google something, you should see your doctor. Now, if you go see your GP and you've already Googled a topic, be open to discussion about the research. Okay? We may have some more information. We may have different information. Okay, and make compliment. Again, I have had people come in and say, Doctor, I've got A, B, and C. I have this disease or this syndrome, and I need you to give me this medication. I'm here just for a second opinion. That's not the way things tend to work. Okay? It's not the okay. So, when should you use the internet before you see a doctor? Well, now we have another really, really wonderful tool of modern science, it's a computer science, are smartphones. Most of them have cameras. If you have a lump, a bump, or a rash, that's when you know it's time to take a picture. And most of the doctors now can receive email, etc. And say, doctor, I got this rash, etc. And most primary care physicians have a rotation through internal medicine and dermatology, or at least familiar with something. Oh, that looks suspicious. I don't know what it is. Come on in. That's when you should use a Google. Uh, you know, and you can now with a, a picture, you can actually search images. Okay. Well, this image looks like this type of rash. Could be a type of cancer. Go in and go and see your doctor. Now, when should you wait until to, to use Google. Well, I would recommend wait until you've, after you've been diagnosed. Okay? Now, contrary to many of my teachers, etc., cetera, um, modern medicine, I think, has produced a lot of more humble doctors. We don't have all the answers. Okay? We do make mistakes, etc. Many times, well, in, in the U.S., unfortunately, we have more restrictions, etc. We make recommendations. We even radiologists, people say, you kind of wait until like the the most expensive, invasive, and uh, specialized exam to tell somebody they have a certain diagnosis. Okay, but here we say, look, all of the, the testing points to this, and that's when you could wait to just uh, have your Google search. When you've been diagnosed, for example, with diabetes, hypertension, some chronic degenerative disease. There's wealth of information for such things. When people come into my office, many a times, if you know, um, I feel that there isn't a level of understanding on their part, we have two options. We have either I I get on one of the um, websites that I person like. Many of them have videos. The website for the American Academy of Family Physicians has many great patient oriented videos. I said, okay, prostate cancer. Okay, this is what the type of surgery you're going to be getting. Okay, endoscopy. You know, this is the type of preparation that you need. This is what we're going to do, etc. Oh, you have diabetes. This is the goal for your treatment. This is what we need to do. This is what you need to do. This is what we can waste time. Okay. So, with, with that being said, we tend to use this form. Oh, and before you walk out, I'll, I also hand paste, print out and hand paste uh, uh, um, some printed material, patient educated uh, 
with patient education materials for their particular diagnosis. Okay. Now, there are, I, there, there are like 30 reputable medical sources uh, online. These are the few. I just list, I'm listing 10. And if you sign up for my newsletter, I'm going to publish and I can email them to you. Okay? WebMD. Okay? The WebMD.com is good. It's uh, accredited by the Utilization Review of uh, Accreditation Commission since 2001. Medline Plus. Medline Plus is also a very good resource. It has much, many articles that are focused towards the patients at the, their register for the lay people. The MayoClinic.org for both doctors and patients. ClevelandClinic.org for doctors and patients. Medscape. Medscape's a little bit more focused towards physicians and nurses. Drugs.com. I, I, I really like drugs.com. Okay? Uh, the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force.org. I know it's a long one. Okay, but many patients come in and say, look, doctor, why are you ordering a colonoscopy this at the other? Well, they are the ones who do a lot of the research and tailor certain recommended um, studies, diagnostic screening studies that are age uh, appropriate, that are sex appropriate, and uh, that are even um, based on your ethnic background, if you're black, Hispanic, Indian descent, etc. Okay? So, what's the future like, look like for use of this tool? Well, Google now has been set uh, to be publishing a um, listing of about 900 known diagnoses that have been vetted by the medical community in the United States. It's focused towards patients who come from the U.S. and Canada. This came uh, uh, very apparent with, there was a, uh, a, a small epidemic of Legionnaire's disease in New York City in 2015. And they noted that there was a spike in people looking for, uh, the, looking for signs and symptoms that, were, that kind of led them to this uh, diagnosis of Legionnaire's disease. Okay? Now, that, that, that's wonderful if you can do that, and I think that's great that you imagine. I've got to remember that approximately that juggle that many diagnoses, 900, okay? And it's really nice to be able to type in. But I think a lot of times you've got to be careful and remember that um, medicine, the way we practice ideally, is an art, okay? Many times uh, 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 I heard an anecdote of a gastroenterologist a, doc, a patient had been in to see him, to see four or five other gastroenterologists, nobody could figure out what's wrong with him. He just simply asked her, what's wrong with you? Where, where do you work? At a bakery, etc., etc. She, she looked on camp, this, that, the other, she, you know, and then she started talking about some dreams. At the end of the day, really what was wrong with her was more psychological, etc., because she had a very traumatic event when she was 14, and she never talked to anybody. And that's something you can't get from getting behind a computer. They threw all the medications at her. She told, spoke with all her friends. Go see Dr. This, go see this, that, the other. Go see the lady, the, the stomagora, who do it here. And at the end of the day, you know, she found this doctor. The doctor sat down and practiced medicine. It wasn't just a GI problem. You know, the GI, the, the gastrointestinal tract, is, it, it, it's an outlet for all of your emotional problems. I mean, that's where we get terms that's, that news is hard to swallow. We choke up. <laughs> my roommate, my neighbor's a pain in the rear end. Okay, I've got a knot in my stomach. Think about it. All of these are actual symptoms. And if we're looking them all up, we're going to get pills, we're going to get testing, all this. And that may not be what you really can need. You just may need to speak to somebody who will guide you. Okay? That's the thing I don't think you're able to get from Google. But it is a very good resource if you can find the good uh, sources. The good sources. Ask your doctor or healthcare provider to provide those sources. Okay? Thank you so much for watching.